Jane. <laughs> All right, we're going to do a quick review of those two videos so that everyone's clear what was happening. Because the first video, let's see how well you guys are paying attention. Was that about serve day? <gasps> oh, good students. No. The first video was about our first missions trip to Honduras. And so we're super excited about that. That trip is happening October 11th through the 20th. 14th through the 20th. That was so close. Anyways, that trip is the 14th through the 20th. If you're interested in going to Honduras and meeting the kids that we sponsor and really making a difference in that community, you can get online and find the link to register. We'd love to have you guys join us. I don't get to go, but my sister is partial, one of the co-leaders of the team, and I know that it's going to be incredible. So we would love to encourage you guys to check that out. Second video, was it about Serve Day? <laughs> Good memories. It was weird though, right? I think it's a little trippy. It's about the Serve Day app that you can learn how to download after the service if you go out to the lobby and meet Steph and Taylor, and they will teach you how to download the app so that you can sign up for the project that you want to be a part of. Sound good? Yeah. Awesome. All right. I am Kelsey Smith. I'm not Dan, surprising, but I am married to Dan, who's the lead pastor here, and I get the honor of spending this morning with you. So I'd love to take a moment and welcome everyone who's listening online. We have so many people who stream our messages every week. So can we give them a new life hello? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, like I said, my name is Kelsey. I usually get to lead you all in worship on Sunday mornings. Um, but in the past year and a half, God has been stirring um, or pressing on me to speak. And so the first time that I got to preach was on Mother's Day, which was about a month and a half ago. And I'm going to tell you a little story. I almost threw up before I got on stage. <laughs> I thought no one was here, and I was like, I'm going to puke. And then I turned around and saw that there were a bunch of people here. And so then I was like, whoa, I'm really going to throw up. And then I started crying because I didn't want to throw up. And it was <laughs> literally a hot mess. So anyways, um, but I was so overwhelmed that people actually showed up. Because how often do we minimize the power that God has given us, Right? How often do we think no one wants to hear about that? But really, it's not from me. It's from God, and I know that people want to hear from him. So just like you guys all showed up that day, I truly believe that God showed up, and he did something that only he can do. He allowed me to speak to you, and he gave me the words and the confidence, and I really hope that he did something powerful in you. I also know that he used that day to do something incredibly powerful in me. Before that, I had told Dan, okay, God's been telling me to preach for a year and a half. I'll do it. But I'm doing it one time, and then I'm done, right? Just, like, get it off my plate. Just say I did it. And that was the amount of faith I had, right? We decide to be obedient. We decide to dip our toe in, and we think, okay, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it once. And then I can tell God, hey, I listened, I did it, I'm done. But I stepped off stage that day, and I looked at Dan, and I said, when do I get to do that again? And you know what? Dan just started laughing because he knows. He knows what it's like to step out in faith like that. And because you know what happens when you step out in faith? When you lean on the strength of God and not on your own strength? When you do something that is so out of your comfort zone that you can literally feel his strength and his hand in everything, you want to do it again. And again and again and again because it's such an incredible thing to feel his power within you. So today, I get the honor of actually starting a new series with you. Like we were already talking about, Serve Day is on July 13th. And so we have a message series that we're calling Serve the City. How many of you, by a show of hands, were able to be a part of Serve Day last year? What? what? Yeah, it was pretty amazing, wasn't it? And how many of you have been a part of what I like to call Serve Day Every Day by bagging over thousands and thousands of bags of sand and delivering them to people's homes? Yeah, that's been incredible. So here at New Life, we don't believe that you choose one day a year to serve your community. We believe that Serve Day is literally every day, and I've been so amazed to see the people of this church truly own that vision. But we do have one special day set aside where New Life, along with all of the ARC churches across the whole U.S., go and serve the each community. So as an entire church, we go out and we have projects around the area where we can bless people. And this is a way for you to dip your toes into what it truly feels like to serve. So leading up to Serve Day, I want to encourage you because we're going to talk about serving your people, serving your city, and Serve Day every day. But before we go any further, would you guys bow your heads and pray with me?
God, we thank you so much for this morning, for the sunshine that is drying up the waters. I thank you for these people who are here this morning in the midst of a busy summer. God, we know there's so many travels and just things taking over our schedule. And so I thank you for these people that have made this a priority to be here and be encouraged by your word this morning. God, I pray that you would continue to shape us into your image, that you would mold us, that you would help us learn how to not just go to church, but how to be the church, how to get planted and how to have those roots that are deep and strong and how we can be connected, God. I pray that you would bless all of, this, all of us this morning, that you would speak through me, that you would speak in spite of me, that I would surrender myself to you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So today I am titling this message, Stop Going to Church. I dare you to post that on your social media and see how many confused comments or emails that we may get regarding this message. But sit tight. I want to make you a promise. I promise that today, if you take what you hear and you apply it to your life, it will make a huge difference. You may even look back on this years from now and see this as the moment that God started doing something very special in you. And I truly believe this is not an overstatement. I promise that you will see, if you apply this, it come to fruition in your life. I'd like to start this message by sharing the story of two people who attend New Life Church with us. I asked each of them to share their journey, and with their permission, I'm going to share it with you. First, I'd like to tell you a story about a girl named Taylor. So Taylor says, I had been attending New Life for about a year, and throughout that entire year, I knew that I wanted to attend Growth Track and even be a part of a life group but there was a lot of fears that I found reasonable excuses for in my head. My husband and I would walk in the doors into the auditorium right as service was starting, then right back out the doors without really talking to anyone. We were happy to stop and chat if anyone stopped us, but we were not willing to make the first contact on our own. We loved the Sunday morning experience, but besides that, we didn't know much about anyone or the church at all. So some of you may be sitting hearing her story and thinking, that sounds a little bit like me, right? nothing wrong with that. Let's talk about Brody. Brody is in a flamingo shirt today, which I find amazing. (laughs) Yes, and ironically enough, this is so just a side topic, but it's matching Caleb Mitchell's flamingo shirt today. I just think that's so great. That was so exciting to me. Made my entire morning. Anyways, Brody serves on our production team, and so he says, I met Kelsey and Dan at my freshman orientation for Western. I came to New Life for nearly two years before getting connected and going to Growth Track. The timing never seemed to fit with work schedules or school events. So some of you are hearing that, thinking, you know what? Yeah, Sundays are hard for me, or it was Saturdays. Who can keep track when Growth Track really is anyways? (laughs) I'm with you. I'm with you. Now it's Sundays, okay? We're sticking on Sundays. But we have this idea of going to church. It's checking off the Sunday morning box. And I want you to hear me when I say that I have been there too for a long time, a long time. So this, I'm speaking to myself just as much as I'm speaking to you guys. But we have this idea that if we check off the box, then certain things will fall into place throughout the week. If I go to church on Sunday morning, maybe I'm more likely to get that promotion I've been waiting for at work. If I go to church on Sunday, maybe my kids will behave. So some of you are today just like Brody and Taylor were. You're going to church but I want to tell you something that may shock you. Maybe, just maybe, some of you need to stop going to church. Now you're thinking, she said she's the pastor's wife. (laughs) Did she just tell me to stop going to church? She's going to be in big trouble when she gets home, right? (laughs) But let me clarify. God's highest calling for you as a follower of Christ was never to go to a church, not to go to a building. His highest calling isn't to go to a destination, but to be conformed into the image of Christ. Not to go to the church, but to be planted in the church. To be the church, a light shining into a dark world. His highest calling is never to go to a church, but to be planted in the house of God, sent out into the world. So maybe instead of going to church, it's time to start being the church and start being planted in the house of God. So where does this idea of being planted in the house of God come from? If you have your Bibles, you can open it to Psalm 92, 12, or you can use your Bible app, or you can just look on the screen, because we do that here, too. Psalm 92, 12 says, the righteous will what? Flourish. The righteous will flourish. 
like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Sounds fun, huh? <laughs> like, what? So weird. So flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Interesting. So what does the word flourish even mean? I don't know about you, but before I started my life group this summer, which is ironically called flourish, I did not use that word ever in sentences. One, I don't like plants. Dan loves plants, and he wants them all over our house, and I kill them all the time. So we have these little, like, things that water them on their own. Yeah? It's pretty sweet. Now they live, and they look great. But anyways, don't talk about flourishing because I hate plants. Secondly, it's not really a word that you bring up in conversation, right? So say I'm sitting down for coffee with Steph, and I say, hey, Steph, how you doing? And she would answer, you know what? I'm really flourishing. (laughs) No, that's just really weird. Or I wouldn't say, hey, Andrew, how's work? And he'd say, you know what? I am just flourishing at work. It's super awkward, right? Not a word that you use. I don't even know if I use it in the right tense or whatever, but like I said, mm, weird word. But what does it actually mean? It means growing. It means thriving. It means to be a blessing. When you're planted in the house of God, in the church, you're growing spiritually, you have relationships that are thriving, and you're seeing the blessing of being the blessing to others. The verse goes on to say that the righteous will flourish like a palm tree, and they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. So why the metaphor of these two trees? In my search to learn about these trees, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say, but I did, And I actually researched, I promise you. I found that cedar trees are known for their size, durability, and their smell. Cedars are described as making an excellent windbreak or living hedge, growing large in span and height and being beautiful to look at. So when Solomon built his temple, he used cedar trees for the columns, the posts, the beams, and the roof because it was meant to last for centuries. When I searched cedar tree problems, because that's my personality, I like to figure out the opposite, I found that literally the only problem with cedars is that animals and bugs are attracted to them. So they're attractive trees. The palm tree, or the palm branch, is symbolic of triumph and victory. So when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, they waved palm branches at him because it was the triumphal entry. So we, being planted in the house of God, are being compared to strength, durability, beauty, and triumph. So who flourishes? Those who are planted. Sadly, when many of us are asked how we are doing, our first response would not be flourishing, right? Instead of saying, I'm spiritually flourishing, we may say, I'm spiritually dry. Instead of saying, we're full of joy, we're discontented or depressed. Instead of being relationally connected, we may feel completely alone and abandoned. Instead of feeling chosen, we feel unwanted. So I go to church, but I'm not flourishing. Those who are planted are those who will flourish. So we need to recognize two things. And if you're a note taker like me, this is your favorite part. So you're like, yes, here are the points. Is that just me? Okay, good. Not alone. We need to recognize that one, your life is a seed. What does that mean? That means that your life has potential to grow, to blossom, to thrive, and to multiply. But a seed also has the potential to lie dormant, to be unproductive, and to be unfruitful. So what does this seed need to thrive? It needs to be planted. When you're planted in the house of the Lord is when you flourish. A seed can only grow if it's planted. In the parable or story in Matthew 13, Jesus talks about a farmer who goes out to sow seed. So some seed is scattered on the rocks. And it can't grow because it's snatched up by birds, right? Some seed falls into shallow soil, and so it blossoms, but then as soon as the sun comes out, it scorches it up and it withers and dies because it doesn't have the roots to withstand the storm. Some started to grow, but thorns around them choked them out, and so they're unable to grow. You see where I'm going with this? We all have a seed. We all have potential, and we all have the secret to what it takes to flourish. But some of us may have rocks in our soil that we haven't dealt with, right? Some unforgiveness, some identity, different rocks that are not allowing your seed to be planted. Some of us only dip our toes into the church, and because of that, when a single trial comes along, we don't have the roots to help us withstand the storm. Some of us are allowing the thorns of others to inhibit our growth. But the seed that falls on good soil can multiply 30, 60, 100 times over. And that one seed becomes a huge blessing because it is planted in good soil. 
So what does it take to flourish? To be planted in the house of God. Your life is a seed, and your seed can only grow if it's planted. So the second thing that we have to recognize is that going to church is not the same as being planted in the church. When I was growing up, I would often ask, are we going to church today? And I had this hope that the answer would be no, because, well, I was went to public school, first of all, and I was awkward, and I didn't have many friends, and I always just felt like I didn't fit in. I hadn't, like Taylor said, I was waiting on that invitation, right? Then I got a boyfriend at church, and that really helped my attendance rise. <laughs> but, hey, even if you're going for the wrong reasons, you're still there, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I tell people. You're still there, and I was still hearing the word of God, and then I started to get planted. So once we start to understand that church isn't a destination, it's a posture. It's who we are. So we stop asking, are we going to church? Eh. Because the answer really becomes a non-negotiable. We aren't just going to church, we are the church. Dan often says we are a movement, not a monument. The church does not exist for us. We exist, we are the church, and we exist for the world. So once we understand what it looks like to be planted, to be flourishing, we realize how little it is about the building, but instead about being part of a calling, a mission, and a revival. So let's go back to Taylor and Brody. For a year to two years, they were going to church, right? They enjoyed it. They enjoyed worship. They got some nuggets from the message, and they said some nice hellos in the lobby. They were going to church, but they weren't planted in the church. So let's, let's catch up on Brody's story. He says, We went through growth track one Saturday in January this year and took the spiritual gifts test, and Kelsey later reached out to see if I was interested in working with the production team on Sunday mornings. I very quickly got plugged in, regardless of being nervous to be stepping outside of my comfort zone. Within a few weeks, I found that I wanted to show up at 7 a.m. on Sundays to help with setup, even if I wasn't scheduled to be working the soundboard. Yeah, Brody! I'd like to remind you, Brody is a college student. 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning, his day off. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. He says, I loved getting to listen to the worship music when there wasn't an audience and see how everyone naturally was. Fast forward to the present, and my current desire is to work on building these relationships that have started to grow. Before I got planted in this church, I just enjoyed showing up on Sundays, listening to amazing worship, and, this is my favorite part, a comical message. <laughs> I think Dan would really love that. And taking that with me. But I never got connected to other people. I never talked with anyone in an effort to build those relationships. Now I love being at church so much on Sunday mornings that I'm currently working on connecting more to people and building these relationships. I think that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now what about Taylor? She says, A Christian writer I really respect had made a blog post about how community is not easy and how you yourself have to put the work in to build relationships and not just expect others to know what you want. That helped my mind shift in waiting for others to find me and instead going out and finding my people in the church. Now, after growth track and being a part of a few life groups, I have a completely different view as to what it means to truly be a member of the church. I want to be early. It's like a common theme. I tend to linger around after service. I willingly introduce myself to someone new and genuinely want to get to know them. I worship much more freely instead of feeling like I have to stay in my bubble. As far as relationships go, I had no clue what an amazing tribe of God-fearing women were out there until I put in the work, made the effort, and was willing to be vulnerable with others. This is my favorite part. I realize now that I had the same invitation that everyone else has to be a part of this bigger picture. It just took me having faith that God would place me right where he knew I needed to be. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, really cool stories. And Taylor now is our social media guru, and she also does announcements. We like to call her Tithing with Taylor, because <laughs> I think that's fun. So what happens when we're planted? These are your next two points, if you're taking notes. One, your roots grow deep. Jeremiah 17, 8 says, They will be like a tree planted by the water. 
that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So I wonder how many of you right now feel like you're being burned by the heat. How many of you are feeling discouraged, wondering how you ended up where you are today? Personally, as I was writing this message, I was literally listening to the sound of heavy rain outside. How many of us are real sick of that sound? Yeah, yeah, we got clapped. Tammy Walker, everybody. <laughs> I, was <laughs> I was looking at the berm that my husband and I had just built the day before in our backyard to protect our basement from getting wet. And I was wondering, is this going to hold? Did we do all of this for nothing? I was aching even more for the people that are already surrounded by water, feeling like they're fighting a losing battle and struggling to not give up. But those who are planted by the water have roots that grow deep. And because of these deep roots, we're not bothered by the heat, we're not afraid of the storms, quite literally, because we know that we have something that satisfies so much more than just what is on the surface. Because of being planted amidst the struggle, I can tell you that I know I'm not alone. I've received texts and words of encouragement from friends. I'm reminded that while I would be sad to not have a dry basement, my happiness may falter, but my joy would remain because I am planted. So let's talk about deep roots for a minute. I have a bit of a class participation. Does anyone know what the tallest living thing is on planet Earth? Why? <gasps> Who said it? The redwoods, Dre Youngblood. Yeah. Golf clap. The redwoods, yes. Now, second question, do you know how they get so tall? <gasps> oh, wow. Are you like a scientist? <laughs> Biology? Deep roots. Yes, deep roots. They can literally grow up to 30 stories high and three stories wide. Isn't that crazy? I can't even picture it. But their roots grow deep. The redwood roots can go down 100 feet and parallel 150 feet. So let's think about this. You have all of these redwoods in the redwood forest, right? And then you have these 30-story foot tall trees, three-story wide trees, and hundreds of feet of roots. So you know what ends up happening? The roots of one tree intertwine with the roots of another and another and another. And you have this amazing support system underground that allows for strength and growth. This is just like the body of Christ. So here's what I can promise you. I promise you that this week you will face opposition. You will face a trial. You'll have a struggle. You may have a setback. You will interact with a crazy person. <laughs> and if you don't, interact with a crazy person, I'll give you three of mine. <laughs> and now you're all thinking, did I interact with her this week? But count the members in my family, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but in all seriousness, you will face some sort of opposition, right? And you know what? Satan really wants you to face it alone. Because when you're alone, you're more vulnerable. I can honestly tell you that I don't really think the devil cares when you go to church. As long as you go in, you go out and you don't become planted. Because then, even if you know the word, you're still isolated and alone. The one thing the devil does not want is for you to find a community of fellow believers, to find those deep roots that withstand the storm, to intertwine with other people. Because when you are standing and fighting the devil back to back with others, he's a lot less likely to win, right? We saw this thing at the art conference, and I really wanted to bring our we had a, what are those things called? Lightsaber. Not really a Star Wars person. Yeah. I didn't know if it was Trek or Wars, but whatever. We had a lightsaber, and he was, Matt, you stop. <laughs> he was showing us how when we're fighting the devil by ourselves, we have all of these areas we're trying to get, right? Because he could be on any side or behind us. But when you're back to back with a believer, you can cover all of the area together. And that is what Satan doesn't want. So what happens when you're planted? Your roots go deep. And what else? Number two, your roots produce fruit. So what is fruit? Paul talks about this fruit in Galatians 5. This is called the fruits of the Spirit. It's not our own gifts, but instead fruits that come from God when we are connected. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. When we're planted, all of these spiritual gifts come up from within us whether we're facing a hard time or not. Joy can come out in the midst of a terrible diagnosis. Love spurs from within you for someone you've recently been wounded by. Patience flows from you as you deal with a fight with your spouse. You can consider it pure joy in the midst of these trials because you are planted, and you can see God doing something very special within you. Then is when something amazing happens. You realize that these fruits are not just for you, right? These fruits are meant to be a blessing to others. Your joy is contagious, your patience is attractive, and your kindness can soften the heart of a stranger. You start taking little steps to serve. Yet it doesn't feel like serving because it's just an overflow from your spirit. You pray for someone, you make a difference, you're a voice of encouragement to someone. Maybe you're a middle school teacher and you love on a kid who is shy and defeated and you see them step on stage in the middle school musical with confidence and you realize, maybe I made a difference, right? And then you see that same kid years later grow into a high schooler and you watch them lead your church in worship and you realize now they are making a difference. Just so you know, that's Mae Campbell that I'm talking about. Pretty awesome. And when I look at this stage during worship, I'm overwhelmed by the fact that I think four of them leading today were in my middle school choir. And never once did I go into that classroom thinking, I'm going to recruit them to be on the worship team. Because I didn't know there was going to be a worship team. I didn't even want a worship team. Sorry. I, I was terrified to plan a church. But to see that God can use your gifts to then bless others, and then those people are a gift. That's multiplication. You may welcome someone who comes through the doors who doesn't look like you, and later they tell you, I was so scared to come, but you helped me feel at home. You miss a week of your life group, and when you come back, you hear, we missed you so much last week. Hey, do you have an update on that prayer request? You suddenly realize I'm planted. My roots are growing, and I'm flourishing. You realize that this isn't just a church you attend. The church is within you, and you are needed. God needs me to do what he created in me only to do, and I am known, and I am loved. I'm planted in the house of God, and then you recognize I'm not just saved from my sins. I'm saved for the glory of God to make a difference in this world. There is such a difference between going to church, which is not God's highest calling for you, and being planted in the house of the Lord. So who is it that flourishes? Only a seed that's planted can grow and flourish. So I want to tell you three practical ways that you've all probably heard before about how you can get planted at New Life Church. Number one, you can attend Growth Track. Clay told you it's today, it's not. It's <laughs> July 14th, but it's directly after service. So like he said, you have time to contemplate, right? But don't contemplate, just come. Just come, I promise. And we've actually really whittled down the time, so now it's like an hour and a half, which is great. You get free food and free childcare. Who doesn't want that? This is a great way to learn more about the house that you're being planted in, to learn more about the vision and values of new life, but more importantly, to learn about the way that God has gifted you. You get to take a spiritual gifts assessment and realize, maybe I am suited to serve. Taylor told me, I didn't know if I had any gifts that the church could use. Little did she know that for that entire year that she was waiting to go to growth track, you know what we were praying for? A social media person. You know what Taylor now does? All of our social media. There is a space to use any gift that God has given you, and we need it. We truly do. The second is you can join a life group. Just this summer, We've had 13 life groups, and I believe even during the school year, we've had up to 20 life groups. And these are all just centered around different interests, whether it's a women's Bible study or sitting around a bonfire talking about life or playing ultimate frisbee or beach volleyball or road cycling, which Dan told me he got whooped in that by Miss Diane Patrick. So great. I love it. 
Anyways, there is always a group for you. And you know what? If you look at it and you think, I'm not interested in any of those, you know what you can do? You can start your own. You guys are so good. You can start your own. All you have to go through is a leadership life group training, and you can start your own, and there may be someone else sitting and waiting for that specific group. The third thing you can do is you can serve on the dream team. We have so many amazing dream teamers here, and let me tell you, church becomes a totally different thing when you're serving. You see the impact that you're having. You get to be the face that's smiling when someone walks in. And you get to see yourself use your gift to help them feel comfortable. You make the coffee, which seems insignificant, but then you hear someone say, oh, I desperately needed a cup of coffee this morning. And then they can be awake to focus in the message, right? Or you think, I like to play guitar a little bit, but I don't know. And then... You're standing back there leading people in worship, and you're literally seeing people find freedom through worship. We want to help you find a place to connect. We want you to feel home, and we want this to be your home. We want you to know that you're making a difference, and, but let me tell you, if this isn't the right place for you, and we understand that it's not for everyone, we want to help you find another great church. And I say that with all sincerity because about six months ago, Dan would say that, and I was like, that's not true. Just stay. Don't go. (laughs) But we have had people leave, right? And we've helped them find churches where they're planted and flourishing, and that's our biggest passion, is not to huddle all of you right here, but for you to be planted and serving God with your gifts. So let's do it. If you're a follower of Christ, it's time. Do you really think that you can find a way through all the spiritual opposition, fight off the temptation of the devil by going to church once a month? Do you really think that when you spend more on coffee than you give to the work of God or people in need, that you can become a true disciple? Do you think that when you spend more time on Instagram in a day than you spend serving others in a week, that you're really going to be conformed to the image of Christ? And this is when Dan would say, Ooh, he just went from preaching to meddling, right? <laughs> But seriously, it's time. You say, well, I tried. I went three weeks in a row. Nothing happened. Listen, it takes time for a tree to grow. Here are five things that it takes for a tree to flourish. It takes soil. It takes light. It takes water. It takes temperature. And it takes time. It takes soil. What's the soil? The soil is your heart. The condition of your heart. It takes light. What's the light? The word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light to your path. The Bible, God's word. It takes water. What's the water? Jesus is the living water who washes and renews your soul. It takes temperature. This one's a little more tricky. I quizzed Dan on all of these. He got all of them right except for this one. The fire of the Holy Spirit warms the seed planted in your heart. And it takes time. When is the best time to plant a tree? Honestly, probably 20 years ago. Unless if you buy one that's like fully grown and then you just put it in there. But when is the best time for you to be planted in the house of the Lord? Honestly, probably 20 years ago. Unless if you're 18, then 18 years ago. But when's the next best time? The next best time is right now. Now is the time because God wants you to flourish like the evergreen the strong cedar, and the victorious triumphant palm. Only those who are planted in the house of the Lord are those who can truly flourish in all that God has for you. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? You are the good, good Father, God. I thank you that you did not put us on this earth to do life alone. God, that you tell us to be planted, to open our hearts, to make relationships, to be real, to be raw. God, that like Taylor said, we can find a tribe of God-fearing people to do life with. That we can fight the devil back to back with others instead of completely on our own, isolated. God, I pray that today, as you're stirring in our hearts ways to get planted, that we would not wait another second that we would take whatever that next step is, God, wherever we are in in our walk with you, whether that's registering for growth track or whether that's saying hello to a stranger in the lobby and asking them about their life, whether that's getting to know someone new, 
whether that's joining a life group, God, whether that's serving on the dream team, finding someone today and saying, hey, I want to use my gifts. God, we're all at different stages of planting, but we know that we can all grow deeper roots. So I pray that today you would encourage us to do that, that we would heed your nudging and that we would step out in faith knowing that you will meet us right there. If you're praying with me today and you may never have received God's forgiveness or you've wandered away and you're ready to come home to his family, to have your heart planted in eternity with him, we're talking about getting planted today, about flourishing in your church, but first, our hearts want to be planted in eternity with you, God. So if you have not made that step to receive God's grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness, if you feel God nudging you today, on the count of three, I'm going to ask that you would bravely raise your hand so, you, so that I know who I am praying with. With all eye, heads bowed and all eyes closed, would you boldly raise your hand if you're ready to accept the forgiveness and salvation that comes only from Jesus? One, two, three. If you raise your hand, I'm so honored to pray with you today. You can put your hands down and from your heart to God's, pray this with me, whether out loud or in your head, you can trust that he hears you. God, I come to you today knowing that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I open my heart to your grace and receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for sending your Son to die for me so that I can live in freedom from my sins and in eternity with you, God. I turn from my old ways and I run to you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. New Life Church, will you put your hands together and celebrate with me those who have put their faith in Jesus today.